Call to Kitty Hawk Town Council to order this Monday, August 5th, 2019 at Kitty Hawk Town Hall. It is now 6 p.m. And uh, welcome to those that have shown up. I believe we have some volunteers and a restaurateur. Welcome. Um, would you join us in a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance? And while we're having a moment of silence, think about all those that have come to harm this past weekend. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is approval of the agenda, and I've added item 6E to the consent agenda. It's uh, basically a renewal of an agreement with NC DOT for a disaster-related debris recovery. We have to have that or we don't get FEMA reimbursement during storm cleanups. Uh, do I hear a motion? Motion to approve the agenda uh, amenda. Second. All I'll in favor. The agenda. How about that? <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. All right, presentations. We have a recognition of Donnie King and Better Beaches OBX. Do you want to start that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the mayor approached me last month, and uh, he knows, everybody knows that the uh, Better Beaches OBX, uh, along with Donnie King, who leads up that group, uh, has been doing a lot of work throughout the town of Kitty Hawk. Uh, most recently, uh, they helped the town plant some beach grasses along Moore Shore Road. And then back in May of this year, the town received a grant um, as part of the Carolina Panthers organization's Keep Pounding Day uh, in the amount of $7,500 that allowed the Better Beaches organization to, to plant uh, along the oceanfront. And I have a video of that day that I'll play first, and then the mayor has something he'd like to present, Donnie King and the Better Beaches. And then I also got some pictures of what it looks like, uh, some of the dune lines and things, the beach grasses that's been planted along the ocean front. I have four or five pictures of that as well. So let me play this video and then I'll show you the pictures and then turn it over to the mayor. So this was May 1st of uh, this year. And um, like I said, it was in conjunction with uh, the call Keep Pounding Day, uh, May 1st, 2019. I believe it's in honor of their former owner of the uh, Panthers, um, but the organization did 25 service projects throughout the state of North Carolina, and they chose the town of Kitty Hawk to receive uh, a portion of those funds. So this was the day back on May 1st of 2019. I'm Donnie King with Better Beaches OBX and Ocean Boulevard Restaurant. We're doing a project today with the Carolina Panthers. It's uh, sponsored by the Carolina Panthers. Uh, they bought all the product and the materials necessary to put these sea oats in the ground. This is part of their Keep Pounding Day initiative. So I'm Kelly Balance. I am a, an entertainment coordinator with the Carolina Panthers. So a couple of our full-time staff members are out here in Kitty Hawk today. And we are planting sea oats to replenish, help replenish the sand dunes. Today is our Keep Pounding Day, um, representing the late Sam Mills 5-1. Um, so today, May 1st, is our inaugural Keep Pounding Day. So members of the Carolina Panthers will be across both states within 25 cities doing service projects along the lines of beautification, literacy, hunger relief, um, and Play 60. So uh, we'll, we're at the beach today, and we are, um, we're working on beautifying and preserving these sand dunes. We got this opportunity by speaking with the town of Kitty Hawk and they were excited to help rebuild these dunes here. So we set up 10 teams of four people, each responsible for a tenth of this mile. And what the four people do is we line up an area to be planted and designate our spacing and then one person drills a hole using a bulb auger. The next person adds a tiny bit of uh, slow release fertilizer the next person plants the root ball of the sea oat, and then the next person makes sure that it has some moisture and that it's covered up. And then they just keep on rolling down the line. Uh, we had a little over 50 people show up today. They're all working right now in separate teams. Um, these people were gathered on social media, through friends' networks, anywhere we can. We have a roster of over 200 people now. 
So these amazing people dedicate their time during lunchtime, usually on most days, to come out and help with sea oats, marking off areas, beach grass. Uh, we also had uh, representatives from the town of Duck, which has a thriving dune maintenance program as well as a, a solid volunteer component, uh, show up and they're handling two sections themselves. The town of Kitty Hawk Public Works is also helping with the planning of the sea oats today for the Carolina Panthers Keep Pounding Day. Uh, we're ferrying the grass around and uh, some of our guys are actually planting. The more grass and sea oats we have on our dunes really helps stabilize the beach, which in turn could help delay the cost of re-nourishing in a few years when we have to do that. Anything we can do to help maintain the beach, we're going to do. This is important because, especially in the area you're looking at right now, there's been a lot of erosion in the past. What's going to help that is a more gradual beach profile, which is encouraged by plantings and uh, the protective dune in large storm scenarios. So that was sort of a recap of what we did that day, and we, we appreciate the uh, Carolina Panthers organization for uh, giving us that uh, donation there to, to, to allow them to do that. And then I just took some, Willie went out and took some pictures today of some of the areas that Donnie, Donnie King and the organization has, has planted, and you can see kind of, you know, what that beach would look like without that there. So it's really going to provide an extra protection for our dunes and, and also help build some height on our existing dunes. And here's some other areas in front of some of our houses. As you can see all these were planted um, by the volunteer group all along the 1.3 miles of beach that we have. So they've been really busy and, and we've tried to support them, giving them plants and anything that we can do to help them um, support their efforts. And then also they, they helped and helped organize the uh, marsh grass planting behind the Moore Shore Road, uh, Moore Shore Road seal project that was completed uh, several months ago uh, along with the Coastal Federation. So you can see the grasses that they planted were, were underwater about a month ago and now you can see them start to come up out of the water there. So I invite everybody to go down Moore Shore Road and take a look at that project. Uh, so we appreciate what Donnie's done and the Better Beaches group and kind of just wanted to recognize him this, this evening and I'll turn it over to the mayor uh, for his presentation. Interesting note on the sea oaks. Uh, when I was young, sea oaks were natural. And then people got to uh, use them for planters and rec uh, decorations in their home, and they had to build a wall so that uh, they can't cut sea oaks. But uh, that's happened in my lifetime, so there it is. Uh, Donnie, the Kitty Hawk Town Council takes great pleasure in presenting this Certificate of Appreciation to Donnie King and Better Beaches OBX. For many years, he and other volunteers have promoted better beaches, healthy dunes, and manageable firms on the Outer Bank. In Kitty Hawk, during the past two years, they have planted over 100,000 sprigs of beach grasses and sea oaks and helped plant 7,000 marsh grass plants at the site of the Moore Shore Road Living Shoreline Project. His service and that of numerous volunteers to our community is noticed, appreciated, and publicly recognized by the certificate presented this fifth day of August 2019, signed by all of council. Thank you. Thank you very much for recognizing our efforts. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the efforts that you had made over the past few years um, in, um, you know, paying attention to the beach, uh, working on um, storm damage reduction, and you know, everything that you've had to endure and organize to get to where we are today. Um, this. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate this and I can't wait to share it with many of the volunteers that have worked with us. 
Um, we have a lot that we're going to be doing this coming year as well. Um, a, a little um, information about the Carolina Panthers effort, Keep Pounding Day. Um, yes, the Panthers um, got in touch with the town and then uh, through, um, you know, through the grace of God or whatever, you know, <laughs> the town contacted me and I got uh, the opportunity to do this. And it was a really fun thing to do. Um, I get a lot of help from uh, Willie Midget at the Public Works Office, and um, he actually came out with his people and provided support. <coughs> Some of his people helped man the teens. Um, Andy Stewart also uh, worked on planting some sea oats with us that day, along with you know 50 to 60 people from all over the Outer Banks. Um, Kelly from the Panthers organization is actually a um, uh, she grew up in Mans Harbor. And then uh, we had some people in Nags Head that have done some plantings with us there. Uh, Kitty Hawk, obviously, a lot of people have been working up here, and from the town of Duck. Um, there was a gentleman named Bruce Spite with the Carolina Panthers, or Bruce Spate, excuse me, who um, kind of helped organize all the uh, tools and everything we needed. And then when it came down to a pinch in the last minute, uh, Willie Midget stepped in and made sure we had everything that we needed to organize 10 teams. Mind you, we were planting a full mile in a relatively short period, you know, from noon to, uh, it was supposed to be noon to three, wound up being noon to about five. Um, it was 85 degrees that day, quite sunny, and it hadn't rained in about a week, so uh, definitely a little more challenging than we expected, but we got the bulk of the job done, and Public Works stepped in once again to finish it. Um, we just uh, really appreciate having that opportunity as well as the continued opportunity to plant beach grasses and other um, do other things to help rebuild a dune system that you know was there you know 50 years ago or so and um, hope that it helps in uh, our resilience when it comes to uh, coastal uh, coastal changes here in the future so uh, thank you again Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a future police station, fire substation, EMS, and Mr. Cahoon, Mayor of Nags Head. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, Commissioners, Andy. Thank you. Appreciate you giving me a few minutes of time to highlight your project here tonight. I'm going to go through a little bit about the scope of what we were asked to do, uh, talk to you a little bit about how we did that, and then um, run through uh, the results of this study that we undertook. So we were given to understand, starting um, at a meeting here back in March, that the town had property um, along 158 where you hoped um, to have the potential to build a new police station. Um, this is up between Bennett and Grissom Streets. Um, also consider whether a small fire station, a satellite station would fit on this property um, and allow both of those stations some room for expansion. And in order to put that project before you um, in, the, in the years to come, you needed to know the scope of that project, um, how this, these facilities would fit on the site, and a little bit about the cost. The total land area under consideration is 80,000 square feet. It's four 100 foot by 200 foot lots. That makes the property 400 feet long north to south and 200 feet deep uh, going back from the highway. You wanted the buildings to be utilitarian, functional, and expandable. We've designed uh, these buildings based on a pre-engineered metal building module that will be um, among the most efficient ways to construct these facilities, the most cost-effective ways to, to um, construct these facilities. We've not considered the design of the buildings in a lot of detail. I can talk to you a little bit about the plans we did generate, but those plans were generated primarily to facilitate looking at the site and how those buildings might fit on the site and allow that room for expansion. Along the way, well, initially hosting an EMS unit was a, also a consideration. That became more of a consideration when we got about halfway into the project, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that 
evolved. Um, we would consider in brief some of the special requirements of the police station. They wanted a holding cell and they needed a large evidence room. And as we got talking in the process, also found that it would be useful to have a garage for storage of impounded bicycles and vehicles and that kind of thing and to provide secure access for some of that, uh, that kind of uh, material. So in order to address the issues that have been set forth in front of us, we, um, we talked to Chief Talley, uh, Police Chief Johnson, and also EMS Director Collins, uh, met with them to talk about what the space requirements for their facilities and the special requirements for those were. We wanted to then determine the approximate footprints of the buildings to have something reasonable that we could put on the site. We looked at the relevant portions of the town code to see what impact uh, setbacks, lock coverage, uh, those kind of requirements would have on your development. And then um, to develop a preliminary site plan, which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about and some opinions of, of cost. As we got into the project and started talking to um, EMS Director Collins, they uh, had some specific requirements. So I met with her and Chief Talley. Um, we developed a, a memorandum that laid out what their space requirements were. And then that, required, that did require that we go into a little more detail on that building in terms of plan because we wanted to be able to break the the projected cost of that facility down so that you could see how those costs would be potentially be allocated between the town and the county for that shared facility and who would bear uh, what part of the cost. So we did go into a little more detail in that in that floor plan and in the cost estimating of that of that facility. So I'll talk now a little bit about the the plan that resulted from that and then I will uh, just in brief touch on the floor plans. I'll do that second. But uh, the, the site plan that you have in front of you, just to orient you, uh, north is to the left and there's an undeveloped piece of property um, to the north that's in separate ownership. At the top of the plan is US 158. On the right end of that plan is a real estate facility that's existing there. And then behind the site is a, um, a small road, private road, that serves the, the golf course. And so what you have on the plan are the two primary buildings, the police station to the left or to the north end of that site, and then fire and EMS to the, to the right or to the south end of that site. There's nothing magical about that. This could just as easily be, re be reversed at this point. Um, so what we did was looking at the, the, uh, the setbacks that you have for development, the approximate size of those facilities, starting with the police station to the left. Behind the building, uh, there needed to be a secure parking area. This would be for uh, the officer's vehicles. This would be a place for storage of um, like their pickup trucks that are used by the, by the police that are in their ownership. They have a couple of trailers that they use, so there needed to be parking for all of those and it needed to be secure and was best located behind the building. Um, then there needed to be parking for the rest of staff, general public, adequate parking for uh, staff meetings and then for training sessions and that generates the rest of the parking arrangement that you see wrapped around the building. Stormwater would be along the front edge of the parking so we could slope the, the, uh, the development to the stormwater and then we put the, um, the, the drain field and the, the um, septic systems, the drain fields and the repair areas at the back side of the site and we observed all of the setbacks required for all of those for all of those components. The police station results in a building that has a gross area of a little over 7,000 square feet based on the space requirements um, that they set forth plus the, the, uh, the garage. And this is configured so that you would pull in uh, a single drive from the road if you were going to the secure area behind the building, you would need to pass through a, a gate into that area. 
that would also lead directly to the garage and there would be a secure entrance to the building on the back so that if you were bringing in a, a suspect, for example, um, or if somebody who wanted to um, come in and give some kind of evidence um, might be able to come in securely through that, that side of the building. The uh, primary entrance to the building for the public would be on the right or the south side where you see the uh, striped area for the handicapped parking. So that's also a little bit weather protected. We prefer putting those public entrances on the south away from the northeast wind. It would have a little bit of a roof over it to give it some protection uh, from the weather. We left room on the north end for some future expansion, so we didn't want to put this up. Regardless of what you build, my approach to this was, regardless of whether it's this board, or whether it's a future board, or whether it's me as an architect, or some other future architect, I tried to configure this so that there was room to place the buildings and always have room for expansion, regardless of what was needed. So I didn't push buildings up against property lines and try to allow some future flexibility for these facilities. On the right hand or the south side, you see the, the fire and EMS station. EMS requested uh, two bays, two smaller bays, and then there would be room for uh, one truck. Uh, that would be a 60 foot deep bay. Then there would be, uh, within that, um, within the condition space, which is to the, to the left. So the right, the right end of that fire and EMS building are the bays, the left side of that building are the enclosed space. That's where the offices, the day room, the kitchen, the restrooms, the sleeping quarters, all of that would be on that would be on that left side, and there's room for expansion of these facilities in both directions. What's envisioned here for, for fire is primarily um, potentially a satellite station with one vehicle, but also uh, during storms when the primary station may be surrounded by water and not accessible. This also gives you a place where you can relocate all of the equipment and function be able to function from this facility. So there's, there's plenty of room there um, for you to be able to do that. So you would pull into the primary drive. There's parking um, along that side of the parking lot for fire and EMS staff for those crews to have parking during turnover and for visitors. Uh, the trucks would pull to the back and come through the return drive into the, and be able to drive forward into the bays and then they would be able to exit out the drive directly to the street and there would be traffic control lights there um, for, for times of response. And in a similar configuration, stormwater would be in front to the south of this uh, facility and then the wastewater systems would be to the rear. Neither of these buildings require very large wastewater systems um, for the, for the <coughs> Police station that would be calculated on staff um, at 40 gallons per day per staff person. For fire and EMS, it would be based um, on square footage for the um, for the uh, for the offices in the day room, and then primarily there are EMS requested um, three or quarters for three crew members um, who would be. Um, on the rescue squad plus a supervisor. So there are uh, small sleeping quarters there for them as a, in addition to restrooms with showers in there for EMS. And then we, in the short term, provided one room for fire use, anticipating that if there was an emergency and everybody relocated up there, at this point, you'd probably convert the day room to extra sleeping facilities in the short term. And again, if you decide at some future point way out there to do more with this facility, then you can expand that, uh, that facility to the north and potentially add vehicles to the vehicle bays to the south. So primary question I think in everybody's mind was, is 80,000 square feet enough to do all of this on uh, reasonably? And it certainly appears that it is adequate space it offers a, actually a pretty nice configuration for these kinds of facilities with plenty of traffic circulation, 
plenty of space for parking and for all of the wastewater and stormwater and all of those things that are required as part of the, part of the infrastructure. The buildings are fairly simple and again rectangular again based on the notion that you could choose to build them as pre-engineered um, metal, metal buildings and then you can do anything from there up that you, that you choose to do. Um, talk a little bit about the floor plans themselves. Andy, how do I get to those two pages? Oh, okay. All right. Great. So this plan is the one, again, that we generated based on the space requirements that the police department gave us. This is not a refined plan. This is the first blush. An architectural Real architectural was beyond the scope of this, but again, the purpose for this is to inform the, the site plan, to give us a footprint that's reasonable, that's close to what it would need to be, that has the general configuration that would, that would work on the site, to kind of tell us where the parking um, and entrances needed to be. So when you look at that plan, you see on the right-hand side, which would be the south, this is the same orientation it was on the site plan. You see that public entrance, and then at the far end, you see that, that garage bay, which you go through that secure parking and that drive aisle feeds directly into that, that garage space. That gives you a private, secure vestibule on that back side of the building, again, for bringing in suspects or having witnesses come in from, from that side of the building, have officers come and go from that side. There could be a holding cell there. And then um, up at the public entrance, at the south end, you would have the foyer, you would have the records receptionist, and then convenient to them would be the file room and the officers and the detectives so that if somebody came in, it would be easy for the receptionist to fetch someone and, and, and put together the person who came in with an inquiry, either with a record or with whoever it was they needed to talk to. And then the rest of it just sort of fits in and fills in um, there. We put all of the, the, um, the officers along one wall, along one quarter, so that they can more easily engage with one another. Patrol room with patrol superintendents in the center, and then the restrooms and the kitchen and, and conference down the side. And then um, as a, in, a, in a separate <coughs> wing on the south are the training and education room. That's next to the vestibule, so that the people who are not members of the department coming in for a training, or if there's a public meeting that's using that room, they can go directly into that space from the vestibule and not have to go into the department. And then there's a physical <coughs> training room there um, as well that's accessible to the officers. So that footprint that was generated from that exercise is the one that we put on the, on the site plan. For fire and EMS in a similar fashion, same orientation as we showed it on the site plan. You see all the bays to the right or to the south. Uh, those bays could be configured, configured in, in other ways. EMS could be next to the building and fire at the, at the outboard side. Um, in the condition space, um, that entrance <coughs> does face east um, with a small porch. You would come into a vestibule and find the EMS superintendent on one side, the fire superintendent on the other. The kitchen and training room, uh, they, EMS requested a small training room um, so that they could have a table with uh, a, a dummy, for example, so that they could do after action evaluation when they come in. If something didn't go the way they wanted in the field, they could address it right there in the training room and talk about how they might do things in a better way, um, have their stored equipment there. And that training is located next to the bay, so we could spill out in the bay if you wanted to do, bring your equipment out and do a, a bigger training. Uh, the day room on the, on the north end, and then um, on the back, aligned along the wall so that they can have windows, or the EMS and the fire overnight uh, sleeping facility with restrooms and a small uh, laundry. And secure storage next to the bay, that would be for EMS storage, medical supplies, and things that they needed to have locked up but convenient to the bay. Um, and so that 
that exercise, it generated that footprint that we put on the plan. And you can see to the left how you could expand that. If in the future, another board or, or you wanted to expand that, provide additional facilities for your fire, you could easily do that by expanding this plan uh, to, the, to the north. Uh, we looked a little bit at, at um, cost information to give you a, a general idea of what to, what to allocate for these facilities. Uh, we did a cost estimate. We also talked with um, we also talked with a contractor that we work with a lot who does a lot of this kind of work. That is metal buildings that are either finished or unfinished uh, to give us some sense of the cost and the development cost. Um, I did a detailed estimate and that very closely agreed with the information that we were being given uh, by, the, by the contractor. So I think, yeah, at this point it's safe, safer to think about ranges of cost. Um, again, there's been no detailed, really, design of either of these facilities, and they could change as you got further into the, into the needs and a little more discussion about the detail. Um, so I, I would suggest just keeping cost ranges in mind at, at this point. So that's what, we, that's what we did. That's the exercise that we completed. Uh, we need to button this up into a final sort of bound version, but essentially that's all of the information um, that I think we needed to generate in order to respond to the request that you gave us. I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay. Anybody? No. No? no. no. Come in. Um, you want? Can you just clarify when you say the metal building? That way, I think that could maybe scare some people. What does what that looks like on the outside? Yeah, well, they can look like anything on the outside. I mean, just about any kind of skin can be put on them. Um, but generally, um, and and part of the reason for cost at this point is that even pre-engineered steel buildings today are a little more expensive than they have been. Steel tariffs and, and other things are having an impact on even those buildings. But generally, uh, the reason for using those is those components are very standard. Um, they're, they're almost off the shelf. Uh, they are regular bays, um, anywhere from 15 to 20 foot wide bays um, that are um, generally you have a wall frame, a uh, roof frame of, of a relatively low slope um, that they can come with a complete roof system and wall system if you choose to do that or you can clad them with any combination of materials but that structural system both reduces your engineering costs because the manufacturer provides some degree of the structural engineering for those and um, and they are structurally the most efficient I mean they Sometimes they're a little over efficient, you know. They they are designed exactly for the loads that are given, and that's part of that you give them. And so they are there's there's no deficiency of them. They 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 are engineered fully for the roof loads, for the wind loads. All the criteria that we give them is just more efficient than having steel custom fabricated or doing a. Um, for large bays like this to do a, a stud and truss system, you, you know, would just not be as cost efficient, generally. Um, ben, <coughs> the road in the back, that's not an extension of Putter Lane? It is. Okay. The ro yes, I'm sorry, it is. I and didn't say and that in that case, the, uh, the road, uh, half the road would belong to us and half belong to the golf course? I believe that's correct, yes. Yeah, okay, I just want to clear that up because that's what I thought. The case was, and there are, there are no buildings behind this one. It happens to be the golf course, that, that's which correct. is a good thing, I guess. That, that's correct. It, it is. You you do um, have within your ordinance your own buffer requirement, which we would apply to all sides of this uh, to to uh, uh, protect the adjacent property owners. Right. So, you know, all of that would all of that was factored in to what we did. Is this an X zone? Yes, it is. Okay, so we don't have to worry about flooding. You don't. We put in to our estimating, um, we, 
you know, I don't have a topographic survey, so I don't know the exact topography. I know that there are some dunes in there, um, and there's probably enough material on site to just sort of move it around. Um, but I did factor into the cost, into these costs, an average of a foot of fill across the entire site, which is not to put a foot on the entire site. It says you can put two feet where the buildings are and then get the slopes to work to get the drainage and everything to work. Mm -hmm. So I did build that cost in. Okay. You may not need all of that. All right. Um, now I need, give me just a minute to explain to the people that will listen to this later and those that are out here listening to us tonight, why are we even considering uh, a police station when we have one? The one we have is flooded twice, Irene and Michael, both times uh, it flooded in there. It may have flooded before that, but I am unaware of it. It used to be a post office when it first started. I don't know if it ever flooded during that, but it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is when we need it most, uh, we're finding that it often is underwater. So that's what prompted us to start looking in this direction. Uh, the utilitarian function is, uh, We've got an awfully nice far house. Um, we don't need something that grand. So that was the direction we put him into. Um, this is for planning purposes. It's not gonna be built tomorrow. Um, not right this minute. Plan to borrow any money for it. We still have beach nourishment to think about uh, within a year and a half, two years coming up. We've got to look at that for uh, taxes and what we do on that situation. Now let's talk about the fire. The fire station uh, is not a station per se. Uh, actually, it's, it's gotten to be a lot bigger than we envisioned, but it's mostly EMS. That's correct. The EMS has wanted for a long time to be up on this end of the beach, and this, they kind of jumped on this. I, am I right in yes, that? Yes, you're correct. They That's really right. would like to be there. Mm -hmm. So we would go to the county and ask them to chip in for something like that, and, and rightly so. So the EMS is kind of driving the, the size of that particular part of the station. Why do we need a satellite station when we've got this uh, nice far house sitting down here? Well, it's in a flood zone and it has been moated by Hurricane Irene and Michael and things of that nature. So even though the station is up, built up, the fact is you've got to get in and out of it to do what you need to do. And so what happens is the fire chief with a fire crew, when we know we have a storm, sends one truck up the hill, up this hill in front behind us here, and they're out in the elements basically during that storm in order to be able to respond in case the fire station is flooded around it. So we need to get them basically some shelter. And that's what this would do. It's a satellite. It would hold a truck, the truck would be there, probably be volunteer <coughs> manning it most of the time, if at all. Um, and, and it's needed for that purpose. There is one other element to that, and that is the state fire marshal for a long, long time has been bugging us to build a station north. And this should satisfy that requirement without building a full-size station. We're only eight square miles. I mean, come on. So we're, we were never planning to do that. But this would give us an option to get people out of harm's way, have them ready during time of need, and maybe facilitate the state fire marshal too. So all of this has been thought into what we're trying to look at and plan for and set aside money for. And it's not something that we would do if we didn't have a real good reason to do it. All right. I should have let you frame that first before I start. <laughs> Good summary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And I Thank you. Stand by any questions you'll need. Put them through Andy. I'll be happy to answer anything. And again, we'll button this up and give you a mail version of this uh, for your future plan. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Everybody satisfied what you saw? Yes, yes. I was. Okay, that's good. That gives us something to work toward. Thank you. Next is public comment. Anybody signed up? No, sir. Anybody want to speak at public comment? Let the record show no one came forward. 
Next is consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So Second. moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. And we have nothing removed from it. New business, amendment to town code, section 20, 51, no parking zones, time restricted parking. And what's going on here is uh, we've had some complaints that the sign says no overnight parking and some people want to park a little later and park a little earlier. We can't really allow overnight parking because people uh, renting homes or using public parking, they'll come in, rent it for a week, park a car and leave it there all week. And that takes from the public we want to serve as well. Um, other people are putting campers and stuff in there. So we have to control that. And that's what this is, what we're driving here. Um, so what we're doing is we already have parking prohibited between 10 and five. And I'm proposing we change that. So I'm gonna make a motion that we change parking prohibited between 12 p.m. and 3 a.m. in beach access parking lots. And that would involve in Bird Street, Lillian Street, Kitty Hawk Bathhouse, and uh, well, that's the ones we're talking about. 12 a.m. I'm sorry? I mean 12 a.m. Uh, 12 p.m. to 3 a.m. 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. 12 a.m. Yeah. 12 midnight. Right. Midnight. Midnight's 12 a.m. Okay. You're getting technical on me. I'm sorry. <laughs> when you come here, you said you couldn't talk. Now you're talking. <laughs> All right, from midnight to 3 a.m. Are we all good on that? That's a proposal now, it's a motion. I'll second that motion. All right, is there any other discussion? Yes, the chief would have his, his officers arresting people all afternoon long. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's a good idea. You know, 10 o'clock, the, the reason being is, you know, sometimes there's full moons and stuff, and 10 o'clock, the night of this, what we're talking about, was a full moon, and the International Space Station was happening to go by, and it was a beautiful night, and so, you know, we, I can understand where somebody could have been out later than 10, so uh, I, I agree with this. This is, needs to be fixed. So. My question, I just have one question, and that was how the 3 a.m., time was there a reason like as opposed to four or five or well um 3 a.m kind of like uh, bars do you know they kick them out for a couple hours <laughs> but it still gives the maximum amount of time and somebody might want to go down and fish in the early morning <clears throat> and that was actually brought up mm -hmm. so that's the only reason i picked okay. 3 a.m yeah. that's fine and Just that was, we, we had talked some other hours and that was what I brought up, was to mention that sometimes, you know, the trout fishermen get up <clears> real early. They're leaving at the crack of day. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure that, you know, we're, the main thing was just trying to get rid of overnight parking, not keep people off the beach. That's right. Night. Yeah, so. and, and the way the sign was read, you know, you can't have the police officer, somebody's in there, and it may be have been within these time frames that were already existing. But he's not going to go up and down the beach looking for somebody to determine if that's what the situation is. Right. So, all right. So we have a motion and we had a second, right? Yes, sir. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There are none. All right. Board of Adjustment appointments. <clears throat> we have. Uh, we have to. Make a regular member, and we need a vice chair. And I talked to Timothy Fish about uh, moving up to the vice chair. So he's, uh, he said he would do that, basically. All right. Do I hear a motion? The first one is a regular member moving Natalie Smith up to Mr. a regular member. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to appoint Natalie Smith, a regular member on the Board of Adjustment, with a term of office to expire June 30th, 2021. I second. Any further nominations? There are none. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right, next is the vice chair. Do I hear a motion to uh, appoint Timothy? Yes, sir, I make a motion to appoint Timothy Fish as vice chair of the Board of Adjustments for one year until successor is named. All right. 
second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There are none. And the last one, we don't have anybody to fill, so we're done with that. <clears throat> and next, we have an appointment to a committee that the county of Derry set up dealing with the census. They call it Complete County Committee for the 2020 Census. And we have a volunteer for that, so I'm going to nominate Craig Garris since he volunteered. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There are none. You got it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you volunteered. Remember that. <laughs> All right. Mr. Town Manager, what you got for us? Um, just uh, kind of one little announcement. We were going to bring it up this evening, but it was raining. The town did uh, purchase a, a new 8-inch pump for our stormwater pumping facilities along the beach road. I do have a picture of it. I'll show it to you. Uh, we actually purchased the pump for around $46,000. The budget amount was seventy-five, dollars so we came in well under budget for the pump. Um, Willie found a company that basically has the same engines and same parts and components. They've just kind of kind of done a little bit different engineering than some of your standard pumps. So um, same quality pump. And I'll show you a picture of that real quick. And we, we just got, we got one of them. Just purchased one, yes, okay. sir. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how this pump <clears throat> turns out, if we're able to use it. And if we do use it, there's sort of a picture of it at uh, the public works facility. So it'll tie right into our uh, connections along the beach road and allow us to provide uh, service kind of immediately after a storm or a flooding situation. And, and depending on the size of the event, we may not need to rent any pumps. As you know, those are quite costly in some of our storms. So we, we have a good feeling it's a John Deere pump, as you can see, and, uh, and uh, we'll keep, that, keep, keep it maintained on a maintenance schedule and hopefully it'll last us 20 to 30 years. So that's good to know. And, and I think with the investment that the town council has made along the ocean front and stormwater pumping, I think it's only right that we, we invest uh, in that pump to, so we can provide immediate service. So we're excited about that. And just another quick announcement for the council. Uh, don't forget the next council meeting is Monday, um, September 9th, and it's at 5 p.m. Uh, the council decided to move that council meeting up an hour to allow the supervisor of elections to get in and set up for the elections the following morning. And that's all the announcements I have this evening. All right. Next we have uh, town, uh, no, attorney. You got nope. anything? Enough for me, Mayor. All right. Keeping quiet. All right. Next, it's town council, and I'm going to start this off tonight because I have something that's of concern to me, and I want the public to know. These are comments concerning workplace safety in the town of Kitty Hall. Citizens of Kitty Hall and those who may visit our town facilities, I need to bring to your attention some changes that weigh heavy in the heart of all council members and town staff. We live in an age of social media unrest and workplace violence. Unfortunately, the small, quiet town of Kitty Hawk apparently is not immune to such potential. Acting on reliable information, we have been forced to change access to staff working areas by the public. The people now behind limited ac access entrance are the same caring, responsible public servants you've always known. They continue to serve as before, but their safety is paramount and the liability too great to ignore. The actions thus far taken are the minimum thought necessary and we hope remain sufficient into the future. It's not something I want to bring to your attention, but it is something we had to, we just had to deal with it. All right. All right. Anybody else? I've got two things. All right, please. Um, first is uh, I want to give a report to the council on the recreation committee meeting which was on July 30th. Um, I'd like to give a big thanks to Christine Buckner, Rita Phyllis, Paul Enriquez, and Tom Hefner for their dedication and efforts that they put into the Recreation Committee. These dedicated volunteers are doing an outstanding job, and thank you, Mayor Perry, for also attending the meeting. Um, items discussed were Sandy Run Park. Um, as you may or may not know, the new workout stations are in place and being used. 
Um, the only thing that um, was brought up, and actually it was brought up by myself because I'm there quite frequently, is that there's some moisture that's being collected under the descriptive panels um, for the workout station. So it's something that we may have to consider down the road about changing out. Um, I also made a suggestion revising the main sign for the complex um, to be more of a directional type sign similar to something like this. Because I think the when people come up, it's just so lengthy, they don't read the whole thing. And I think maybe something like this, we get a lot of people who don't speak English or read English there also. So maybe something like this might be helpful. Um, we do see a lot of people on the path, on bicycles, on scooters. And when you're walking on the path by yourself or with your dog and somebody comes flying up behind you on a bicycle, it'll scare you half to death. So um, we got to find a way to keep wheeled vehicles off of there, unless it's a wheelchair or something like that. Um, the committee also has been reviewing the master plan for the year. Really, Paul and Andy have been doing it. Um, a tremendous amount of work's been put into updating and revising the document. Um, they've done a great job, but there's been some discussion about removing the references to the biathlon and um, also possibly removing the references to Heritage Day also. So um, in the end, I think the committee members felt it was best to leave in Heritage Day in case in the future the town would decide to bring that popular event back either at its probably not at the former location, but maybe at a future location. Um, Tom had provided us with an update on the recommendation of flashing lights at the Living Shore Project on Moore Shore Road. He indicated that Andy was working with DOT and that hopefully this will move forward soon. Um, the next Recreation Committee meeting is scheduled for October 29th at 6 p.m. if anybody would like to attend. Um, the other item that I wanted to bring up this evening was I got a call this weekend from a resident that lives on the beach road who called me because a neighbor had been injured Saturday night after walking on the beach. It was dark, she couldn't see, and she walked into a tent that had a tent frame that had been left on the beach. Um, thankfully, it, she wasn't injured badly. She has a black eye, but it could have been a whole lot worse. Um, my immediate response was, and let me check the website and see what I can find. When I pulled up the town website and I looked under beach rules, there were some rules and regulations there, but they don't really coincide with this safety guide, which is what the lifeguards give out to people. I found this out today after speaking with Cole Yates about it. Um, and this particular um, document says, leave footprints only. Please remove all personal items when leaving the beach, including umbrellas, beach canopies, chairs, volleyball nets, and games. Please fill in holes in the sand. Items left overnight present a safety hazard for our emergency personnel. Well, my question to Cole was, what do you do by items that are, what do you do with them when you come in the morning if there's, you know, 10 frames out there? What do you do? And he said, well, we kind of monitor it, and if no one shows up to claim it, then we dispose of it. And my question to him was, well, do we have an ordinance about that? Or how can you make that decision? What do you do if the people show up and say, hey, I left my frame here, and, and now it's gone, and I want it back? So I just wanted to bring it up to you all. And Andy has provided me, me with copies of ordinances from the other towns regarding overnight equipment that's left. I mean, I certainly don't want the beach patrol out there searching for people or writing tickets or that kind of stuff. I just think that we need to be able to have the right to remove items that are left without being liable for them. Okay. Um, I will comment on that. This subject has come up before. Uh, runner running on the beach late at night and uh, running into the skeletons of these tents. They do get left often by uh, people. They buy them at Walmart, they put them up, leave them there for the week, um, and tend to camp out. And at one point when we didn't have a beach, it became a real issue because they were camping out on the only spots where we had a beach and crowding everybody else out. So that kind of went away when we did beach nourishment. Um, the other aspect on actually having them removed every day or something like that, the council that 
was in place at that time did not want to do that. So this would be something new to add. And if the rest of you feel like we need to add a section, I, I see a section in here that says basically if it's left overnight or if it's left more than a day, uh, then the town has a right to remove it. That's the real difference. We don't have, pers we can do that, but we don't have it in a context of an ordinance. So if you think we need to do that, then tonight we can give direction to the manager and have that accomplished. A couple other things I want to say before we go any further is when I talked with Andy about it, the last time it was brought up was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke with Cole today, he said that during the study that he did during a, a week in July, a specific day in July, what he would think would be one of the busier days of the summer, in a four mile stretch, he saw 10 to 20 um, tents, you know, and that was five years ago. And, you know, those things have become ever more popular. You can buy them anywhere. You can buy suntan lotion just about. I mean, they're everywhere and they're disposable because they're relatively inexpensive. Like, I think that uh, Willie would probably agree with me now that there's really more of them there on the beach, you know, probably, I don't know how, five or 10 times more. Willie, what would you say? 30 to 40 at night get left, average. Do they get picked back up? Or are you having to pick them up? I'm not picking them up. Usually we end up picking them up on Friday when they pile them up on the trash can. Oh, oh, you mean the renters pick, uh, pull them in? When they get done with them, they pull them by the trash can and they get picked up. They're either alongside the 12 or they have Okay, we're talking two different things here now. <laughs> we're talking whether or not people can have a tent out there. And the other issue is whether or not we have the right to pick it up if it looks like it's been left. Am I right? I think that, in, I mean, anybody can have the, I'm not saying they shouldn't have the right to have a tent. They just can't leave the structure, the bones of it, so to speak, when they, they want to leave it because they don't want to have to come back tomorrow and reclaim their spot. You know, I don't care how wide the beach gets, we're still going to have them there. And that's, that's more prevalent than when I was growing up, we didn't have that. You know, we had beach umbrellas and they were the bad kind that flipped outwards all the time, you know, but now that's the new thing that everybody takes their tent to the beach. They're compact, you can strap it on your shoulder and they, they don't want to lose their spot. So they leave it overnight. And that's how this lady ended up getting hurt. So what, do you, what are you proposing? Um, I think that it would be probably better for the town to have something on the books or at least on the website about, like it says in this brochure, that that's what the beach rules are. Because anymore, when somebody wants to know something, um, they use this and they go to Google and they put in Kitty Hawk beach rules. And when they pull that up and the town site comes up, you pull up the beach rules and regulations and it has about six <clears throat> things on it, but doesn't have that. Doesn't have anything about you know taking your trash out or leaving your umbrella or your chairs or whatever. I mean, I think that should be done at a minimum. But I think that the other towns have, for whatever reason, all decided that they all have an ordinance. We're the only ones that don't. That's true. Mm -hmm. and, and that was intentional mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. Now we have a different council. Council, what do you want to do? I still think we're talking about two different things, maybe. I'm not sure. Are, are, we, are we talking about if they're staying in front of their house and they pull their cover off and they go in for dinner and go to bed and leave that frame? Or are we talking about um, not knowing if it's left on a Sunday and it's been sitting out there for two days and Willie goes and takes it off of the beach and throws it in the trash? That, that's what I'm not so you know, are we talking about ones that we know have been abandoned for two or three days and we're going to remove those and then if they come back and then maybe we're covering ourselves, or are we talking about on a nightly basis patrolling and taking tents and, and no. going up and saying that see there's one i don't want to go there oh i don't either i don't either but I, I i can see where if there's ever been a problem where willie or whoever does this i don't think you go on the beach do you willie to ride up and down on a saturday and sunday to to make a call um, have you, Joel? Go ahead. So, um, I remember 14 when we talked about this. Yeah. The other towns they tag, it's just right. like a tag they put on the tent and you educate them. You know, mm -hmm. um, and the lifeguards don't know about it because they don't in the morning. So, I don't want to get in the business of talking to everyone at the beach, at 
tent, but I think if they're there in the morning, we tag it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that. If somebody, you know, we could, you know, I don't know how we could do it. But in my eyes, it's living. You know, um, I don't leave my mess on the beach, and I live here. Um, so this is up to you guys. I noticed that the other day when I was out there Friday, and then now she brings it up. I was out there late uh, with my son surfing, and um, it was I saw a dove. Yeah, down the it didn't look too pleasing, but um, and they are off the dune line. They are off the dune line, some of them. But one was at Bird Street Beach Access, so they just left it there, and the next day they come to drag it back out. Just that's my take on it. Anybody else? Cole would be better one to talk yeah, to. It, I mean, if they wanted to go with some kind of just a warning tag or something, I mean, if they feel like that, if some, I mean, it seems like a lot of work, but just a warning, you know, if, please remove it or something, I, I don't know. We, we don't want to punish that runner who's, who's getting up early at 6 o'clock in the morning and going out on the beach, set up a tent for his family because he wants to mark that spot. Right. We don't want to punish that, that vacationer either. That's, that's not right. But you don't want to punish some of them are going to go out on Monday morning and stick out their area and expect for the whole to week. be able to keep it yeah. for the entire week. And maybe just it's maybe it's education. Maybe it's just more education that the public needs. Um, well, I think we tried the education part, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Uh, here's a suggestion. Okay. Instead of making a decision tonight, sure. <clears throat> I think we need to direct Andy to look at the other towns They've already come up with some different ordinances. Bring to us uh, some choices mm -hmm. to see if anything fits in the category you want to do, and uh, we'll go from there. The summer's yep. almost over. Yeah. Right. It's not an issue for this year. This year is what we got. Uh, and, and if we, we can, could in, in, include uh, Cole, you know, because he's yes. there on a regular. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and whoever else Andy would like to haul in. To, that's why I'm okay. pushing it mm -hmm. off to Andy. That's a good <laughs> idea. I like that. <laughs> I'll bring you back some recommendations. That's what I can do. I know how to delegate. Okay. That's prohibited between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. So Tina's had something to say. I've had something to say. Jeff, did you have something? Yeah, time? I did. I'm just going to push mine off on Andy real quick, save us some time. Uh, uh, I do. I, I've been contacted a couple days this week, and uh, and it's kind of troubling to me. Um, we know we've been dealing with the homeless problem for increasingly here for a little while. We've just had to make an ordinance tonight to, for people sleeping in their cars, and it's a problem we've dealt with at our parks. Uh, on occasions and what I've noticed uh, over this last week um, which was brought to my attention that some of the the people uh, the homeless people are, are choosing our public walk accesses to spend the day and most of them were or um, under the influence of either alcohol or narcotics or they seem to be um, really um, intoxicated to me um, I went over, uh, one of the guys was walking down the center of the road right at the Pelican Watch, I mean, uh, um, the Kitty Hawk intersection, Black Pelican, one shoe on, one shoe off in the middle of the road with a 12 pack in his hand. He went up and, and he sat on top of the overlook and I observed him there all day and he was there all day yesterday. Um, I've seen people concerned about his health. I'm, I'm concerned about his health as far as getting run over. So I brought the question, what can be done? And to either help him or, or, or help the visitors here to be able to use that access. I, I personally wouldn't take my family up there with what I've seen going on this week. So I, I don't know if it's public property. I don't know if the town has anything in place or wants to do anything. Uh, I was just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention that it, it's concerning some people that there's people on these ramps that uh, on a regular basis and they were just wondering where the town stands on on this or what we can do with this kind of a thing and I, I have no idea and so I just wanted to bring it to the council's attention that had been brought to mind and see where if anybody wants to go anywhere with it. I think we got a police chief that could probably the gentleman question, uh, I personally, uh, I think the gentleman who was talking about the 
gentleman the question I've personally been from uh, the skate park and our parks on the Woods Road. Um, and I've, I've recently banned him from the bathhouse. He was up there. And um, we had an incident with him this weekend, I think. Oh. So, yeah. um, so, and he, we have run him off there. So what has to happen with whoever owns a, the, the place? And if we, if we own that access, right? Mm -hmm. I'll go up there and we'll, I'll tell him, because I'm acting on behalf of the town of Kitty Hall, uh, instead of one of my officers, and I'll serve him with a, with a letter, and we'll give it to him. And um, he has a severe alcohol issue. He's not violent. Um, we have personally, the officers uh, have personally tried to get him help numerous times. Um, I had a 30-minute conversation with him about doing the right thing. The last time we dealt with him, I went up and sat with him, and we got him an ambulance, and he was guaranteeing us this was it. I'm going away. I'm going to get better. And then two days later, he's coming back on his bicycle. You know, um, we, you know, it is displeasing, mm -hmm. you know, at times. Um, but uh, he has a disease, and we have tried and tried to help him. And at some point, you know, we got to uh, we got to put our foot down. And I didn't know about this incident, but um, you know, we can't ban him from the beach. Um, unless you know, you know, it's a public access, but we can uh, we can ban him from the, our, the the property. We own that property, sure. Mm -hmm. um, Kilva Hills deals with him regularly, and Max Head deals with him regularly. Um, he says that Kitty Hawk, <laughs> he likes Kitty Hawk better because <laughs> the officers don't treat him. They treat him different, you know. But we still take him to jail if he needs mm -hmm. to go to jail. Never had any problems with him stealing anything. Mm -hmm. That nature is just, he's just got an issue. And, um, but um, we can talk to him. We'll sure find him. It's not hard to find. And we can talk to him about that. But whatever y'all direction you give me, we you know. But we do have, if, if he is, if, I don't want, I don't want anything in jail. To sure. be, I, I'd love to see him get some help. But that, that's not about what I'm trying to say. I, 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 I just, if, if there's an instance where he is so publicly intoxicated, is there some way that you can just get him on the beach or remove him or call we, somebody without throwing him in jail? Or, or is that the only... He, he's homeless. <clears throat> yeah. And he won't tell us where he's living. Mm -hmm. So he moves from woodland to woodland. Um, and he doesn't have to tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, we know his name. Um, there's several, but this one has always seems to become, become an issue. Uh, <clears throat> there is not a so-called law of public intoxication anymore like there used to be uh, and when Andy Griffin was a sheriff they just put yeah. somebody, they put somebody in, in jail we do have um, we used to be able to take people to jail for what they called safekeeping if they could control themselves but now they won't let you do that anymore they have to go to the hospital who picks up the hospital bill and then they have to be evaluated at the hospital and then we have to take them over to be evaluated there then they let them go it's, it's a broken record um, um, I really don't know. I mean, it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. It's very frustrating. Um, for on our standpoint, too, um, to what to, what to do with him, but um, or with the certain instances of, of this, and and we do have we have had complaints, and where we removed him in the trash on that same. It was in June, I believe. It was a hot day. <coughs> Has, have you had complaints from people trying to use the beach that he's harassed them or anything no, like that? No, uh -huh. just that well, we did that one time, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was another gentleman that was with him in particular. Um, he usually keeps to himself. Uh, it's usually he's, quiet. He's ill too, mm -hmm. so. Um, um, I was just so that I, my thing is I, I was just wanting to, to know uh, when somebody was to ask me, uh, from now on, I can just say, you know, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. Yeah, sure. sure. If, if, <clears throat> if it's bad enough, they can go arrest him. We've had him taken yeah. numerous times. What the officers try to uh, attempt to do at this particular last several times, look, you need help, and we call EMS, and they mm -hmm. come get him. Then we take him off and we get him evaluated in the hospital, and then he's back out. Um, it's pretty much a cycle. This is an expensive cycle. Um, and we're, we're all um, discussing to the point of what are we going to, you know. Do we? Does the town pay for that hospital visit? Uh, no, we don't, we oh. don't do that. Oh, no. He requests okay. EMS. We, we convince him. You know, he, he, actually, he actually has money. Now, he may have health insurance. I'm not sure. But if we were to take him for an evaluation for detox, we could possibly be on that for that. Because it used to be if you took him to the sheriff's department, 
sheriff's department was sent them to the hospital, then the sheriff's department in the county was on the lick for the, for the bill. But now the sheriff's department, like, you can't bring them in here now. You've got to take them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we have an experience, so this is kind of a new thing. We're, we're, <coughs> we're not going to get into paying. You know, I don't want to, to get that for the taxpayer. Is this the same fellow that was camped out yes, at, at the uh, dog park? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So he's using places where there are bath facilities of some sort, mm -hmm. bathroom facilities. Yes, All right. But I'll, 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 I'll look into it and get back with you. How about that? Yeah. Just and, and, talk about and, yeah, and you can get with Andy and just, yeah, and, and just come up with a, <clears throat> if you could, something that would be good for him and, and us too. <laughs> um, Jason, can you add anything? Yeah. I, Chief Johnson, you, he's, he's updated me some here on the uh, laws. I mean, I'm clearly we're in the criminal context at that point. I mean, I can't imagine anything from a civil standpoint. I mean, if he's not causing any disruptions, if he's not harassing anybody. So, but I would have said public intoxication or something. I would have thought that still existed and not my, not my world. So um, chief's told he us. Was, I, I did hear the call about him on the road when we got there, you know, and if he'd have been impeding traffic, there would have been a, mm -hmm. something there. But then in turn, we arrest him and his blood alcohol content is blood the point three zero. We have to take him to the hospital. And it would have been. It, it would have been. <laughs> For sure. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, we do not know where this gentleman lives. You know, right. um, we've been, I've been hearing different things. I was talking to Willie this morning about this situation that um, they're in one particular area. Uh, he told me this morning that some people are sleeping and we're going to take care of that tonight if they're there. So and it's in a public place where you would never expect it. So we're going to take care of that tonight. Does they have family anywhere near? All right. His father is the only one that we know of. Some of the officers have gotten, you know, because they yeah. care about it, they want him to get help. Yeah, sure. But, yeah. um, they, they've talked to him. I know his father sends him money, and he has money. Um, so we're just trying to, um, you know, they're trying to you know, get him back home, too, trying to get a number and get him home, but he won't provide any of that information because he doesn't have to. He's an adult. I would probably say he's in his 50s. All right. Okay. Well, I just wanted to, like I said, I just wanted to bring it to council's attention and, and to Joel and, and, and see if we can. This is uh, last time this happened was in June, I remember. So. Well, and I guess we're going to have, could potentially have more problems from, for citizens when the bathhouse is closed. Right. You know, where is he going to go then? Is he going to sleep under cottages or whatever? <clears throat> Do the best you can. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. still not as bad as San Francisco no, and no. LA and no. other places. Yeah. I'll report back to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Joe. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynn? Nothing? How about you, Greg? Uh, very good comments about letting the public know the security changes we've had to make here at Town Hall. It was a tough decision. It bothered all of us. We had a lot of conversations amongst us. Uh, our town staff here are very, obviously very important to us, and we want them to feel safe, to make sure they are safe. The people that come in here and conduct business are also of high concern to us. We want them to feel comfortable to come in this building at all times. So that's the reason we've had to make these security decisions. Will there be more forthcoming? We don't know that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll see what goes. Uh, the police station, great justification, Mr. Mayor, uh, very eloquently said. Uh, I would like Andy to, to look at, bring us back some options. You said it right. This is not something we can do now. This is something for the future. Uh, how much in the future? Don't even want to hear the word raising taxes. If we've got to raise taxes, we will not have a new police station. I'll go on record and say that. That's not an option. But what kind of options do we have? What kind of time frame are we looking at? Because this is a large decision. So, so when maybe can we start looking at that decision to see if we're one, two, three years down the road, whatever. But until we look further, we won't know what that answer is. So. If council is okay, Andy, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Mayor, if this is okay with you, to explore some, some options that we have and maybe bring it back at the next meeting. If that's too soon, we can go to the October meeting. But if you could let us know about that, I, I certainly would appreciate it. I think it would give us something all to think about. 
Thank you. When you say options, you. You, you're talking uh, what? borrowed money, or how long will it take us to save the money? What, what kind of options are you what else, Whatever he can come up. He may say we don't have any options right now unless we borrow or raise taxes, and, and I'm out with that. That's, don't even think about it. I can put together some timelines, things like that. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. I mean, currently we, uh, I didn't get to read the cover sheet, but yeah. um, current, we've been setting aside money since 1819, which was only last year. Um, we have $325,000 in the reserve, which we'll have, we budgeted this year 200,000, last year was 125, so. Um, um, so, I mean, I can look at, kind of look at our financial situation and, <coughs> and come up with some, uh, some timelines and some time frames that gives everybody an idea of if we continue to fund the police department at 200,000, how much, you know, how much will we need? What year are we looking at yeah. for design and those types of things? Um, and then I can also look at if there's any extra monies moving forward to apply to that maybe the, to move the project forward. Um, I can do that as well, so. Yeah, thank you. I don't know about y'all, I thought the floor plan Mayor Cahoon came up with, I thought that looked great. Yeah, it did look real good. Fire and EMS, I thought it looked very good. But just, well, just one more thing that I didn't get to say, because I see uh, Commissioner, County Commissioner Bateman there out there. Um, the county, we just, they wanted to participate. They don't have any plans for to fund it right now. It would have to still go before their capital improvements board. So I just wanted to make sure, being that we've got the press here, and I told County Manager um, Bobby Alton that you know I would make sure that there has been no commitment from from the Board of County Commissioners to this project. I didn't want to make it seem as if mm -hmm. the county is on board. I mean, there's still a lot of funding things that need to be worked out and timelines put to it, and and probably uh, knowing where you know obviously where where their where their funding would come into play at would also help us with our timeline as well. So maybe I can get some things together and kind of get an idea as to when this would possible, you know, be possible uh, with the option of, of not financing the project. Um, and then, of course, the only way to do it now, I can tell you, would be to finance the project. But if that option's out, I'll come up with some timelines of some, uh, as to when, when I think that the project would be capable of being at least started design and construction. So, but I wanted to put that out there that the county isn't, you know, we wanted to work with the county because it, it does make sense for the taxpayer that we all work together, being that we already have that property and, and they needed to solve a solid need for a EMS station on the, in the north side of our town here that would reduce the response times to our residents because currently the EMS is coming from Kildova Hills. So there's a benefit here for everybody. It's just kind of having to work it out and see where it all plays out. So I'll, I'll bring you back something at our next meeting. In regards to a longer term financing picture. The fire station EMS uh, is, is really separate. Separate. Correct. They don't have yeah. to be done together. No, they don't. Right. That's correct. So, uh, look at it from that point of view. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I think that's all of us. Next, we have public comment. Anybody, after all you've heard tonight, want to say anything? <laughs> Will that the record show? No one came forward. Motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Never none. <laughs> Thank you.